So in the first video I introduced SIM cards and how we can use SIM trace by Osmocom to trace the communication between the phone and the SIM card. So let's slowly make our way up into the network. Before we look at the first phone, I quickly want to get everybody on track when it comes to the different telecommunications technologies. So you definitely have heard the terms 2G, 3G, UMTS, GSM, LTE, GPRS, 4G, Edge and maybe more. The Gs stand for generations, second, third and fourth generation and basically they are the PR names for GSM, UMTS and LTE. GPRS and Edge and loads of other terms are extensions that added something to those bigger standards. Phone connections are generally direct connections. That's very different from the internet where we use single packets. At least historically, phone networks are direct connections to enable real-time communication. LTE is actually now also packet-based. Packet-based communication has gotten so fast nowadays that you can transmit basically real-time communication through packets. You know this from Skype. So in GSM, things like GPRS and Edge add packet-based communication to the circuit-switched style GSM network. While now in LTE, we need an extension to have calls. Voice over LTE enables phone calls over LTE. The packet-based internet has become so important. And so actually, this extension Voice over LTE is not very widely deployed yet. So typically, for calls, your modern phone will still use UMTS or GSM. It's all a huge mess. GSM was first deployed in Finland in December 1991 and as of 2014 it has become the global standard for mobile communications with over 90% market share. At some point we then got UMTS and nowadays we have LTE. And as you probably know from the corner on your phone you still see all of those things. It's not like LTE replaced GSM today. So you would maybe think we ignore GSM nowadays, it's old and we focus on LTE. But the truth is, GSM is still hugely important. A lot of things you might not know about use GSM. So for example, a lot of point of sale terminals where you can pay by card have a SIM card inside and that's how it communicates with the credit card banking network. And so understanding GSM is still super beneficial. However, it's difficult to do that. I mean, nobody has to set up their own phone network at home, right? But that doesn't stop people from wanting to understand it. And so the project Osmocom, which stands for Open Source Mobile Communications, is trying to do just that. Here's a small snippet from Harald Welt Laforge on Twitter, who is the founder of Osmocom, describing the state of the development in 2015 at the 32C3 conference. By the way, they also run the conference GSM network during the Congress start with a little bit of a history of open source and mobile communication protocols. Um, uh, you have to remember that we started about 16 years after the proprietary implementations. So the GSM network uh, uh, that we are running here at the event, um, or that we started to run seven years ago, started 16 years after GSM networks were run first in the public in Europe, so in, at, at public operators. So we're really, really late. Um, and if you want to like to compare the status of um, open source mobile communications with open source operating system, then I would say you, we are about where Linux was in 94 or 95. So I would say capable but not taken seriously is sort of the, uh, the general status. So I would like to add that maybe the mobile operators that build proprietary technologies might not take you seriously, but I think we as the wider IT community really appreciate the work you and all the other contributors have done. As you know, I make these videos because Vadim Janitsky, who is an Osmocom contributor, reached out to me. Maybe that's not what you expected. Uh, not LTE, GSM is like old crap, what do I want with that? But that's the reality. These things are so complex and require a huge amount of work. So I hope you can really appreciate the work that has been done here and I hope you see the incredible value that still has. Long story short, what I want to say is, we look at GSM in these videos. Last video I promised you to tell you what is so special about the old Motorola and Nokia phone. And maybe you remember the Troopers badge that I have shown in this video. I also had an interview with one of the creators of it. The reason for that was that the Nokia phone has some really nice capabilities. So let's Vadim introduce us to it. 
Some old phones from Nokia like this one do have a well-researched debug interface enabled. Well, better to say not disabled after manufacturing. For example, this interface can be used to enable well-known network monitor. By the way, this Nokia 1280 was released later than 3310 and it has no network monitor. Wikipedia even has an entry for that. Nokia Monitor Mode or Monitor Mode was a hidden mode on most Nokia cell phones used to measure network parameters. The mode can only be activated over a special FBUS or MBUS cable. If you check out the Troopers video, you will hear a bit about the FBUS. But yeah, so here the network monitor is running. So what can we see here? Basically, there are many test displays where one can observe some information or even modify some parameters. For example, here we can see which channel this phone is using at the moment. On the top right corner, we can see the ARFCN, which stands for Absolute Radio Frequency Number. Let's look up the GSM RFCN number. So we have 2G and the number was 1681 and 1683, not that important. And the frequency is 1743 MHz up and 1839 MHz down like. Just a quick refresher. GSM is like any other radio wave, it has a certain wavelength. It's all on the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light is just a small part of it, and so 1700 MHz is, I think, a bit under 20 cm wavelength. So it would be somewhere here on the spectrum. From a Nokia network monitor manual, we can also see that if you are transmitting, then you would have there the transmit strength. But phones are not always transmitting. Most of the time, they are just listening. On the top middle part of this screen, one can see how strong is the signal from current base station. At the moment, this phone is listening to a broadcast channel called CCCH, or Common Control Channel. And this is exactly where the phone expects to see paging requests. Paging requests are used by the network in order to notify subscribers about incoming calls or SMS messages. As soon as paging request is received, the phone needs to establish a dedicated channel with the network. So we are currently in CCCH, that's a control channel. If we were in a call, we would switch to a traffic channel. There are two types of traffic channels, TCH full rate and TCH half rate. The full rate channel provides higher bit rate and better quality of speech, while the half rate channel allows to increase the network capacity, since two subscribers can use a single time slot at the same time. So as Vadim said in the control channel, we are waiting for example so-called paging requests from the network. If there is for example a call or SMS incoming, the base station would send out a paging request asking if this particular phone is in this area. It's a broadcast. Why that particular base station thinks the phone should be in this area, we will talk shortly. I mean, it's logical that not all base stations in the whole world can send out paging requests asking where the phone is, right? So in this case, a base station just yells out, hey, is this phone here nearby? And our phones are constantly listening for these paging requests. And when our phone realizes, oh, that's me, it will respond with a channel request. And that is done through RAC. The random access channel. So this is a channel any phone is allowed to use. And it happens on the same frequency that we looked up with the RAFCN number. And the base station is listening for those. And so if two phones at the same time would ask for a dedicated channel at the same time, they would collide like two people talking over each other and they would not get their own channel. But let's say it succeeded. The base station received your channel request. Now the base station looks at all the currently used channels and will assign you a time slot. So this is where TDMA comes into play. Time division multiple access. You somehow need to divide up the limited radio space you have. You need to make sure multiple phones can talk to a base station and the other way around. So, time division multiple access. Let's deconstruct that name. We need multiple phones to access the base station to respond. And we do that by dividing time. Every phone gets a time slot. Madim suggested I explain that with a crossroad. Imagine you have a crossroad with traffic lights and the lights turn red and green in a nice pattern. If all directions would be allowed to drive at the same time, that would be a problem. So the traffic light always assigns a short time slot where one phone is allowed to drive traffic, pun intended. So a traffic light is a good example for a time division multiple access system. If we keep using the traffic example, we can also use it to refer back to the RFCN numbers and the frequencies. Earlier we learned that there are two different frequencies, up and down. So that's like a road with two lanes. 
each frequency can be used to transmit data. It's all electromagnetic waves and we can build antennas that can be tuned to only recognize and send a particular frequency. It's basically the same way how our eyes are tuned to only see a band, a small slice of a certain visible light or color frequency. Anyway, because we have two frequencies we can send and receive at the same time. If there were only one frequency, only the base station or only the phone could send something and then you would have to figure out how to organize that. The same way like a narrow street with two cars on it. But luckily we have two frequencies, one up and down, so we only need to organize multiple phones, which we solve with time division like on the crossroad. And instead of traffic lights telling us when we can send, we use the random access channel, yell at the base station, can you tell me when I can send? And the base station sees that time slot 3 is free and tells you to only send in time slot 3. By the way, here with RAC messages you also have the first security issue with GSM. Here is a denial of service. Of course you could just jam the radio frequencies so the phone or the base station couldn't communicate anymore, but you can also flood the base station with RAC messages. You request a channel, then the base station will allocate a time slot for you and there are limited time slots. You can't have infinitely many phones sending in the limited radio space. Of course the base station will free up channels when they are not used anymore, but if you keep requesting new ones, other phones will probably not be able to get a connection going. Let's reboot this phone in order to see what would happen. As you can see it remembers the last ARC and it was tuned too. The phone always looks for a channel with the best signal quality. So now it's on its DCCH, standalone dedicated control channel. This channel is usually used to perform location updates. Location update is something like, hey, I'm here at this particular part of the planet. And this answers the question how the network knows which base station to use for the broadcast when you get a call. When you turn on your phone or you move around, your phone will send a location update request to a nearby base station which will update that information on a central server of the operator. And when somebody wants to call you, the operator can look up your last location or the last base station you were connected to and then use that particular base station or base stations in the area to send a paging request out and hopefully your device responds. The network monitor has a few different screens with information and one interesting one that is kind of related to your location are the neighbor base stations. The first one here is the current serving cell, the one you communicate with and the other two are neighbors and they obviously use a different ARFCN number because they need to communicate on a different frequency pair otherwise the two base stations would get into the way, makes sense right? This is also super important to know for the phone because imagine when you are in a call and walk or worse drive fast in a car. Your phone constantly has to switch base stations, always trying to talk to the one with the highest signal strength, which is usually the closest one. Imagine in the middle of a call two base stations and your phone have to perform a crazy handover so you can keep talking. It's crazy. It amazes me that it all works so well. The network monitor is already pretty cool and we can learn quite some stuff about GSM with it. But it can actually do a bit more when hooked up via the FBUS to a computer. It is also possible to forward layer 2 messages via FBUS interface and then inspect them for example using Wireshark. The phone would forward both uplink and downlink packets as well as SIM card related messages. So basically this debug interface allows you to see the SIM messages where we last time needed the external tool SIMtrace and it can also show us GSM messages. But anyway, this solution is not as powerful as Calypso based phones like this one. So next time, let's see what's up with the Calypso chip in the Motorola.